today's class is going to be a little different. Usually what I do when I prepare for a class is I do my research and, um, you know, bring my, my knowledge up to, to current um, views um, and current studies and current um, surveys and current findings and things like that. Um, and then I put it all together in a nice package and then I basically read it. So to some, it might seem a little impersonable, impersonal, um, but my theory is this, I'd rather um, give a 15 minute class with jam packed information rather than a 45 minute one where I'm just kind of talking and, and derailing because trust me, I can derail often. So today I just wanted to talk a little bit about, okay, so you just found out uh, you've been betrayed. You feel duped. Now, I just want to say, um, I did write some notes for this class, so my thoughts may be all over the place, and I'm going to give about three years of information crammed into about 15 minutes, so bear with me, and I apologize in advance if I'm all over the place, because I'm going to be. Um, uh, what I want to say is, uh, this is sometimes when I'm speaking at public events, how I will explain um, betrayal trauma. So imagine that you are on a bridge that's about two miles above ground. And in each of your hands, you're holding two of your young babies. And under the bridge is lava and fire. You're crossing the bridge with the person you love and you trust the most walking in front of you. So they're leading the way. They're gonna lead you into safety. So you're holding your two babies and you're following the person you love and trust the most across the other side, and there's lava and fire under you everywhere. So you're walking and you feel the heat of the bridge and you bring your babies a little tighter and you promise them that things are gonna be okay and you're gonna protect them. And you're following your loved ones and you start to feel the bridge move a little. And so you're getting a little anxious, maybe a little concerned, maybe a little afraid, but you don't want to show it to your kids. So you're holding them and you're comforting them and you're telling them everything's going to be okay. I got you. I'm going to protect you. And as you're walking, you start to feel the bridge shake a little bit more and you don't know what's going on, uh, but you ignore it because the one that you love and trust the most is going to get you to safety. Before you know it, the bridge collapses. All you know and see and feel is that fire and lava beneath you. You are clenching onto your babies while you're falling, looking around to what in the world can I grab onto to save my life and to save the ones that I love the most around me. And as you're falling and as you're trying to grab onto something to hold onto because you don't want, you, you will completely decimate your very existence and your kids that you're holding if you fall into that lava, into that fire. And you look up and you see that the person you loved and trusted the most is holding the hammer. They're the ones that broke the bridge. They're the ones that destroyed that bridge. So while you're trying to hold on to whatever you can find while you're falling and comfort those around you, you're thinking, I, you're, 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 you're not thinking. <laughs> Your brain is hijacked. That's the beginning of betrayal trauma. Now, the reason I say that in the beginning of this little uh, uh, theory or, or story, the reason I say is that you're holding on to your babies and you feel the bridge moving, but you just ignore it. That's what's called betrayal blindness or it's what some people call the Red Riding Hood syndrome. Red Riding Hood um, saw the wolf, saw the wolf's big eyes, noticed his teeth, but she wanted to visit her grandma so desperately, she ignored what she knew were danger signs, were red flags. Um, so oftentimes uh, we do sense something with our significant other, with our neighbor, our parents, our boss, wherever your uh, uh, betrayal was, but we choose to ignore it. And then what happens is after the betrayal comes to light, then we start putting all this negative blame on ourselves. Why didn't I see it? Why didn't I notice it? Why didn't I take it seriously? You know, whatever. But that's all that. Okay. So uh, first thing, so you, you, you recently discovered your, uh, a, a close someone betrayed you. 
you're going to have what's called triggers. Now, triggers is our body's physiological response. And basically, they are a defense mechanism, although they don't feel like it when they happen because triggers can take you to your knees within milliseconds and everything's triggering, triggering after betrayal. It could be... Um, Sadly, things in your house. I mean, if this is a spousal betrayal or a significant other betrayal, you can't look at a picture. You can't go into a room. You are constantly triggered. Um, uh, um, driving down the street, listening to songs, uh, certain smells, certain everything is trigger, triggering. And basically that um, triggers your fight or flight response. So just know triggers are common. Um, they will bring you to your feet. Um, uh, it's good to kind of talk to your triggers, lean into your triggers. And, and um, what I tell people initially is um, ground yourself with when it comes to triggers, you know, um, tell yourself what's five things I see right now around me. What are four things that I can touch? What are three things that I can smell? What are two things that I, you know, so you're grounding yourself with your five senses. Um, and then when you get to a point where you, uh, uh, and again, I know I'm jumping from, from zero to a hundred in this class, just bear with me. But when you get to a point where you can, um, start to be a little bit more in control and in control of your triggers, that's when you can start challenging them. Okay. Is it happening now? Is there a wild tiger in the room right now, uh, about to viciously attack me? No, this is just a trigger. Um, is this trigger true? Uh, is, is, is there fact with this trigger? Um, and then start asking yourself questions about, is this trigger helping me become the person I want to be? Is this person bringing me to that 2.0 um, life or person that I want to be? So those are triggers. Now, I'm going to talk about something that a lot of people don't talk about, and it's called, um, uh, I believe it's hypersensitive bonding. I call it hyperbonding. It's, or it's hysterical bonding, sorry. But I call it hyperbonding. This is, uh, now, this isn't with everybody. This is with just some people. What happens is once you discover, I'm going to use again, a spousal betrayal or a significant other betrayal. Once you discover there's been an affair or an addiction or whatever, sometimes what we go through, it's called um, hysterical bond bonding. I call it again, hyper bonding. And what that is, is that your sex drive skyrockets. Now it's almost counter intuitive or counter, you know, you're thinking to myself, no, this person disgusts me. But what happens is you find yourself having more sex with this person than ever. Maybe even doing things you haven't done before, trying different things. You are hyper bonding. Um, uh, let me go to my notes. Um, okay. So basically what happens is that you are basically trying to reclaim your your what you own you're trying to this is a time where your body is like you you are you are giving up your body so much to to make sure you have and don't lose the person in your life that's hyper bonding what winds up happening however is that um when this hyper bonding or hysterical bonding stage and phase kind of ends you feel so usually you feel so disappointed and gross and disgusting because then we go into uh, a stage in a phase where we don't want to be touched by this disgusting monster that, that had an affair or cheated on us or what have you. Um, so the reason I wanted to bring this up is because a lot of people don't understand this hysterical bonding, this hyper bonding, and they just feel like they're, you know, uh, almost becoming a prostitute for the person they love, but then they have a lot of shame. Why in the world did I give my body up to this person when he was just with somebody else? Um, but just know that it's, that it's a part, hyper bonding is a part of the healing process after you've been duped and betrayed. Um, again, this hyper bonding is, um, is uh, it, it's a desperate stage and phase. Uh, it's, a, it's your body's natural physiological response. Not everybody, but a lot of people. Um, where almost any request your spouse has from a sexual perspective is granted. Um, and you're doing things that you know he or she likes or requests that maybe you wouldn't do before. And especially once you get out of this stage, you're thinking, I am so disappointed in myself that I would lower myself that much to grant their every um, wish. When, when really, I, I, I wish I <laughs> could just <laughs> smash them with my car. Okay. But basically what happens is, like I said, we're trying to desperately hold on. I don't want to stay on this hyperbonding too much because I have other things to, to, um, 
to cover. Um, but the next thing I want to do is talk about, and this is something that people don't talk about often, is oftentimes after, uh, an, um, whether it's a physical, emotional, or what have you, affair or hookup or whatever you find after your um, spouse, some people go through a stage and a phase where thinking about their spouse with the affair partner or the hookup person or whatever actually turns them on. Now, um, for a lot of you, you're looking at me right now saying, okay, what kind of coach are you? And you're disturbing. And I get it. Wonderful. But this happens to a lot of people um, where uh, let's just say they think about their spouse watching porn. They get a adrenaline rush. Or let's just say you're self-pleasuring and you're thinking about what your person did with another person. And that actually brings you to climax. Um, this happens with a lot of people and just know that it's common. Um, it is a stage and a phase. I've worked with people who had it for a couple of weeks. I've had it for people that actually it lasted over a year. Um, a lot of uh, coaches and therapists and, you know, have differing viewpoints on why this happens. My personal opinion is that we are, our, this is our body's way of trying to recapture something we lost. Um, so if you have these thoughts or you had these thoughts, you're, you're not a monster. You're not going insane. You're not crazy. They're actually kind of common. Um, okay. Let's see here. I'm done with that. Um, you're going to go through a grieving stage and, and what's interesting with grieving is that everybody grieves differently. Everybody grieves differently. Some people uh, take a long time to grieve. Some people don't grieve for long. Some people grieve the most ridiculous things to other people. And some people, so, so, you know, I'm sure you've heard of the five stages of grief. Sometimes people talk about the 12 stages of grief, you know, the denial, the bargaining, the realization, the acceptance, the this and that. They're, they're not cut and paste. Um, uh, stages and phases. I mean, grief is a wound tight ball. It's, you know, those rubber band balls you get at, you know, Staples or whatever uh, um, supply stores. Um, that's what grieving is. It's like, it's all over the place. It hits you out. You have this grief burst out of nowhere. Um, and that's because, you know, you're, you're losing, you're, you're grieving so much of, you know, what you thought you had, or what you thought was real, loss of security, loss of self-confidence, loss of dreams, loss of um, desires. Um, every loss that you're grieving needs to be um, addressed and dealt with. Um, and grieving, the grieving process can last really anywhere from, you know, four months to four years. It really depends on so many factors, you know, how you handle, well, first of all, your attachment style as you're a child, how you handled grief as a child, what your examples of grief were, what your love language is, how you handle grief in general, um, to what extent were you attached or relied upon the person who um, betrayed you. I mean, the grieving process is, is so different for, for everybody because of the many different complexities and dynamics of the betrayal. Um, one of the things that um, I encourage people to do uh, um, after discovery is create what's called a lifeline list. Uh, and basically, the reason I, I, I um, encourage people to write our lifeline list is because so many times when we are, um, and we don't even have to be triggered, especially at the beginning stages. I mean, oh my Lord, we are bear hugging the toilet, vomiting, and, and our life is flashing before our eyes. But one of the, as you get a little bit more in, um, after that whole um, discovery period, I have what people have people create what's called a lifeline list. And that's because oftentimes our brain is so hijacked, we just can't think. So I have people create a lifeline li list um, of needs and desires and wants. So I have them write down, what are your needs? And then three resources to uh, fulfill those needs. And you have to write this when you're more in a logical mindset, because so many times we have our needs when we're in an emotional mindset. 
So this actually gives us a, um, something that when we're logical, we write it down. That way, when we're in an emotional mindset, which we're going to be often, especially in the beginning stages, we have a visual where we don't have to think because our frontal cortex is, is, is not working <laughs> usually when we're in an emotional mindset, mindset. So what this list does is, okay, I need somebody to pray with who are three people or three whomever that I know I can pick up the phone and at any given given moment, they can pray with me. And you write down three, three people, three pastors, three, whatever the case may be, three friends, three family members that will no judgment. They'll just simply pick up the phone and start praying with me. Write it down. Name three restaurants or places that you can call that will deliver a meal because there's going to be times you're in the fetal position in bed, but your kids are hungry. You can't get up and cook. You need to have three of these resources. We can, hey, DoorDash, whatever, pizza, 20 minutes later, half an hour later, there's a pizza at your door. So three places that deliver, three restaurants that, that have food that everybody in your family will eat. Um, three people you can call immediately that'll come in and take care of your kids, no questions asked. There's going to be times where you might have to go for a ride and blast music or scream. There might be times you just simply go in your garage or in your car and punch the steering wheel or scream at the top of your lungs. Three people who you can call immediately uh, that will come over and, and just take care of your kids. Um, uh, you know, three, whatever the case is. So, I mean, I, I, I have a lifeline list. I have it in a class, you know, that I gave. Basically, you're writing down things so that when you're in an emotional mindset and you can't think, you go to your lifeline list and you're like, oh yeah, okay, here are the three places I can go to at two o'clock in the morning that are open. Yada, yada, yada. That's right. Because you're not thinking. So this is your lifeline list. Um, now, as you uh, get onto the to the dealing and healing part of betrayal, um, studies show that there's five um, elements that are that are musts um, when it comes to healing. And um, so the first element is details. So um, now, when I say knowing details of the situation of the betrayal, I don't mean precisely what happened just more curiosities as to what led to my spouse doing A, B, or C, what led to my parent doing A, B, and C, what led to my child doing A, B, and C. So you don't necessarily, you're not being like um, an investigator knowing all the details. You kind of want more of the, of the, the title of the headline. You don't want the story. Now, you're, you're, you're absolutely do the story if you want it. It is your right to know every bra size, position, you name it. But you cannot unsee what you see. You cannot unhear what you hear. And you have to ask yourself, will this information in the long run um, be necessary for my healing? Okay, the next thing is to um, release anger. Now, keep in mind that anger um, is a secondary emotion to fear, frustration, and fear, whatever. We all know what that is. So oftentimes when we're angry, why are we angry? Um, is, there, is there sadness? Is there fear? Is there frustration um, or a combination thereof? Um, and name those. So instead of always, you know, I'm angry, I'm angry, I'm angry. What is your fear about exactly? What is your frustration about exactly? What is your sadness? What are those things under that anger? Name them, address them. That's two. Three, um, show commitment. And when I mean commitment, that means if you are going to work on, if this is a spousal betrayal, partner betrayal, if you're going to work on it, be proactive and productive with being committed to working forward with that person. Now, before you're committed to that person, you have to be committed to yourself. Be committed to yourself that you are gonna challenge your triggers. You are gonna challenge your inner critic. You are gonna challenge your inner dialogue. Um, that is my commitment to myself. And then also uh, with that comes your commitment that you're gonna work on this, You know, with it, providing the other person is just as committed and just as proactive. Um, number four, rebuild trust. Now, first and foremost, again, because I am an intrapersonal relationship coach, 
So I suggest building trust within yourself. You have to, um, uh, a lot of times we ignore our gut. We have learned to ignore our intuition. This is the time to go back and rebuild trust with yourself. Um, challenge that betrayal blindness that you may or may not have had. Challenge, you know, I hear so many times, oh, uh, I picked the wrong person. I mean, no, 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 no. We were duped. You were duped. Yeah, there's no such thing as picking the wrong person. Um, uh, and also keep in mind, it, it, you know, that people change. So, 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 um, you know, you, you picked the person you did with the knowledge and information and awareness that you had at the time. Now situations change, people change. So you can't, you know, say to yourself, oh, 15 years ago, I picked the wrong person that, that, you know, people change, you know, I mean, you're not the same person you were five years ago. You're not going to be the same person five years from now than you are today. So you can't say, you know, oh, I picked the wrong person. The person you're with today is almost a completely different person than the person you were with five or 10 years ago. Um, so you have to rebuild trust um, with yourself first and then with the person you're working on. If you're not working on anything with anyone, building trust within yourself is key, crucial, is a key, crucial component. And then number five, which is the re rebuilding and, and the rebirth, which is rebuilding everything around you. I mean, you know, a lot of people, uh, especially with anxiety, they don't like the term of um, that old life is dead. Um, because there was a lot of love in that old life. There was a lot of joy in that old life. There was a lot of happy memories with that old life. And that's all great, fine and dandy. Um, and this is a part of the grieving process is like, holy crap, what do I grieve? What do I sort out? I mean, your life was a filing cabinet, a very beautifully, neatly organized filing cabinet. And somebody came and climbed a mountain and turned that filing cabinet upside down you got files, folders, papers, all of like what's real, what's meaningful. It's time to rebuild. What do I put back in that filing cabinet? I mean, <laughs> ooh, this is complex. I don't have to tell you you're watching this class. You're here for a reason, but, uh, but you do want to rebuild and you have to rebuild from the ground up, making new rules, new protocol. Um, uh, so those are the, um, five uh, elements to healing from betrayal. Know that betrayal oftentimes is going to be two steps forward, three steps back. Um, you're going to find yourself as you go along that you might have hours, sometimes days, sometimes weeks without a trigger. And then all of a sudden a smell comes, a sight comes, something happens and you feel rage inside or you feel sadness inside and you're laying on the bed in a fetal position. You're like, oh my God, are you serious? Like what I use it. I always say, we don't ever get over trauma. We don't ever get over betrayal. We don't, we learn to live with it. I told somebody the other day, if you get a, um, what do you call those bow and arrows? If you, if you get an arrow into your heart, the initial thing is, you know, blood's gushing all over and it's profound and it's crisis management. And that's very similar to, you know, D-Day, Discovery Day. After a while, uh, you can't take that, you can't take that arrow out when it comes to betrayal. The arrow is going to stay in that heart forever, forever. Your heart kind of heals around it. So in due time, um, you're almost going to barely notice the arrow, but once in a while, once in a while, that stick that's hanging out of your heart with the arrow in your heart will, will catch on something and you'll feel a little sting. You are like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that happened. And hopefully at that point, you've utilized all the tools, all the resources, all you've gained so much knowledge that you use that little ting um, as a reminder of, of, I don't, I don't want to say something appreciative or something good, but how you've learned and grown from that experience. I know I was all over this class and I apologize, but, um, I just kind of wanted to give a lot of people who's ever watching this, a little insight from D-Day, which is the bear hugging, vomiting on the toilet, you cannot believe this is a dream that you're, you're in a dream. Like you're seriously thinking, Oh my God, I can't wait to come out of this nightmare.
because this is just not real. There's no way this can be real until you go through the grieving process and to acceptance, moving into maybe forgiveness. And again, keeping in mind, forgiveness is not, it's okay what you did. Forgiveness is I'm accepting what happened. Um, going into, you know, the healing, the rebirth, the rebuilding, and eventually, hopefully, the thriving.